Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to have you join us today. I'm Trudy Mitchell, the CEO of Australia for UNHCR. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to traditional owners of the land from where you are joining us today. A special welcome to members of our board, our ambassadors and special representatives who are joining us today. And a really big um, welcome to um, you all for joining us today. Today we're talking about the unfolding drought and food crisis in the Horn of Africa. Currently, um, it's estimated that 20 million people are facing extreme hunger um, as the region grapples with the worst drought in 40 years. People across the Horn of Africa have been forced to leave their homes in search of food, water and pastures for their livestock. This situation has been made worse by the soaring food and commodity prices due to the Ukraine war and also regional conflict. So we can see, um, we'll have a, uh, the, uh, a map of the Horn of Africa that comes up. And um, that gives you a good idea of uh, the area that we're looking at um, today and we're focused on. Um, and we've got a really terrific panel who you can see um, with me today um, from, from that region who've got really fabulous insights into what is um, going on. From Somalia, Somalia's capital, Mogadishu, uh, we're joined by Nazanin Mashiri. Uh, Nazanin is a senior analyst for the climate and for climate and security in Africa for the International Crisis Group. Um, this group works to prevent and manage and resolve deadly conflict, and it does this by um, field research, analysis, and high-level advocacy. Welcome, um, Nazanin. From Ethiopia, we have Johannes Zek, um, who is UNHCR's head of the sub-office in Melkadida. Um, this part of Ethiopia hosts 212,000 refugees and almost 200,000 displaced people. Um, welcome to Johannes. Joining us from Uganda's capital, Kampala, Kampala is Simon Odong. Although, Simon, you're um, closer to the South Sudanese border at the moment in a place called Palabek is my understanding. So um, welcome from there. Simon is an expert on UNHCR's water, sanitation and hygiene programs. And today you'll probably hear us talk about WASH, uh, which is just an abbreviation of water, sanitation and hygiene. Also, um, a big welcome to Juliet Murakasani. Um, Juliet is the Deputy Representative at UNHCR in South Sudan. Um, she is based there, but currently is joining us from Barcelona. So we've got um, quite a lot of coverage going on, which is uh, just wonderful. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, hear from each of our um, great panel today, which um, will be uh, very insightful. So we'll be talking today about uh, the impact of drought and climate stresses, um, how that um, impacts conflict and also uh, the impact of rising prices that are driving food insecurity in that region. Uh, and also what UNHCR uh, is doing to support people who have been displaced uh, by this, this current um, situation. If you have questions, um, please uh, put them in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we do have quite a lot to get through this afternoon, but I'll do my best to get to any questions um, if possible. So um, thanks very much. So let's start this afternoon by talking about the drought. Uh, Nazanin has been visiting drought affected communities in the region of her work with the International Crisis Group. Um, she was recently in Likipia, and I hope I've got that right, Likipia County in Kenya, where she filed a report from the field. Um, we're going to watch that report now and then come back to Nazanin.
But we're here in Old Masoni, which is still within the borders of Laikipia County. And what herders here are telling us is that they've had very little rain during this long rainy season. Livelihoods and livestock have been decimated in this region and herders are really concerned about the possibility of another failed rainy season later this year. Nazanin, it's um, very sad to hear um, somebody who's had 60 cows and they've gone to just six. Um, just that impact would be um, terrible on that family and community. Um, so we've seen that um, how devastating the drought is for farmers. And um, can you tell us about how it's affecting people more broadly across the Horn of Africa? And just give us a bit of an overview of the situation, please. You're on mute, just. Sorry, sure. As I mentioned in that report, um, since 2020 or around 2020, um, many parts of the eastern part of the Horn of Africa um, have received very little rain. Uh, when, and when rain has come, it's come kind of often in, in the wrong places at the wrong time and in, in a deluge causing flooding in, in, in other parts of the region. So pretty useless in terms of farming or in terms of uh, water for uh, pasture for herders. And we're expecting a fifth failed rainy season uh, later on this year, um, which is going to be even more devastating. So the impact really has been uh, mainly on uh, livestock. So we've seen um, millions of animals dying. And those animals provide uh, livelihoods for people like herders uh, that I spoke to um, and herding communities here in Somalia as well, and nutrition as well for many families and children. And we're seeing very high levels of malnutrition in those worst hit areas, particularly here uh, in Somalia. We're seeing families who have lost uh, children uh, or children have arrived in certain points where they can receive aid, but they're extremely weak and malnourished and susceptible to you know, diseases that could be easily treatable if they were able to get help earlier. Um, at the same time as a drought, the reason it, the region's also seeing unprecedented levels of flooding in South Sudan, for example. We've also seen uh, heavy rains in, in, in Northern and Western uh, Ethiopia. Um, but you know, the drought is so concerning because it, because it comes at a difficult time as well in terms of the food crisis, as you mentioned there, with, with inflation, but also uh, with conflict too, um, and blockades, you know, being caused by groups such as Al-Shabaab in Somalia, or conflict areas such as Tigray uh, in Ethiopia. So this sort of combination of, of conflict, climate and costs is decimating livelihoods and really impacting on the very vulnerable uh, people. And, um... We, I think, I'll, I'll move on to Juliet. And Juliet, as um, Nazanin has just said, South Sudan's been experienced both floods and droughts recently. And I think you've got some pictures um, of the recent flooding um, in, in those areas. Can you tell us what's happening um, from, from that picture and um, what the climate stresses are and how they're affecting the people in the country? Thank you. <clears throat> so, as you can see, in South Sudan, it's a really large country and it's experiencing drought uh, or climate change, flooding, intercommunal violence, drought. Um, in this photo, it's in the Upper Nile, where the drought, the, the flooding, it's not coming from the rain. It's coming from uh, Lake Victoria together with Nile. And then if you see Upper Nile, it's completely covered with water. So people are moving to the higher land uh, with their animals and they, they become displaced in this area. And again, in South Sudan, uh, 
as I say, it's bigger, it's a large country. In Upper Nile, you experience uh, flooding. And then in Eastern Equatoria, there is a drought in Capueta, uh, where also displaced people. At the same time, it's also the intercommunal fighting where the people with the, with the cows, they are coming to the Eastern Equatoria where people are farming, where they are eating their, their crops, and then they, are, they start fighting between them. So if you see in South Sudan, it's all challenges are there. And actually, I think it's, um, it sounds quite strange to say we've got floods and droughts. And, and um, one of our questions here from Michael is, you know, how, how can there be so much water if there's no rain? And I think you, you've, you've answered that. Um, thanks, Juliet. Um, I think another question we've got from uh, our, our supporters is, you know, as we know, women and children make up 80% of um, refugees worldwide. And, you know, we know that they're the most vulnerable. And what are you seeing now? Um, uh, how is it impacting women and children, the drought situation? I can give an example of uh, one of our camp, for example, when it comes to the food insecurity, uh, in, to, in last year, the food cut was up to 50% in the camps. And this leads to the families going to the bushes to look for food. And as a result, uh, one family got some fruit and some leaves, and then uh, they cook it. When the children eat it, four children passed away. So, and then also, uh, this is for the girls. And then of course they don't go to school because there is no food. And then they end up getting married and the boys are going to the long distances to look for employment where they work in the farmers or with the cattle or in the uh, shop to, to feed, to support their families. So really this impact very much our persons of concern, refugees in the camp and also the host community. Okay, thank you, Juliet. I think um, it, it always seems that um, women and girls are um, always at, at more risk when these situations happen, as you say. Um, Johannes, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, you're joining us from Melkadida in southern Ethiopia. So thank you for that. And I understand that you've been traveling quite a bit into quite remote areas over the last few days. Um, you've sent us some pictures from um, around Melkadida. So we'll have a look at that now. And can you tell us about uh, what is happening in Melkadida and how the people have been affected by drought there, please? Thank you very much, Trudy, and good afternoon. Um, we are, in, uh, as you said, I'm, I'm based in the, in the southeast of the Ethiopia in Melkadida. It's a, it's a very remote area close to the border with uh, Somalia and Kenya. And uh, we have been hosting more than 200,000 refugees from Somalia here for almost 10 years. And until the government of Ethiopia closed the border in May this year, we have received growing numbers of, of refugees from Somalia fleeing a combination of drought and insecurity, mostly induced by Al-Shabaab. So I can only um, echo what uh, Nazanin has, has said. It's really, um, it's a triple crisis that we are faced uh, with here. Um, we have the drought, which is obviously a, a result of, of, of climate change. We are going into the fifth season without rain. So here we don't even have the privilege of having you know, flash floods. It's 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 literally not rained since uh, since uh, since five seasons. Um, we have the the soaring commodity prices for a variety of reasons. Um, so I've I've just asked colleagues to print me the we are tracking the price developments just to give you an indication. Um, from the beginning of the year to today, the price for onion, for example, has increased by. Uh, 121 percent, so more than 100 um, percent. For tomatoes, 150 percent. For fuel, 130 percent. So um, the price increases in these remote areas are very significant, and it's especially significant for fuel, food, and fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big shortage uh, uh, of fuel and fertilizer, so it's hard to come by. And if you 
and, and, and have access to it, it's, it's very, very expensive so that many people cannot afford it. And the third element is, is really conflict. Um, and, and, you know, Ethiopia is in the, in, the, in, the, in the headlines for what is happening in the north. We are in the southeast and we have, uh, we have had uh, um, a, a rising number of incursions from Al-Shabaab into Ethiopia over the last weeks. And, and, and to the west, we have an internal conflict within Ethiopia in the Oromia region. Um, so we are a bit engulfed by, by, by conflict. The reason why I'm saying this is because as a result of all these things, people uh, flee their homes and, and people are on the move. And the, I think the main driver for this displacement, there are several triggers, but the main driver is search for water. Mm. Um, we can literally observe that people try to um, move towards areas where they can expect regular access uh, to water. Thanks, Johannes. And we had three photographs that came up there. Um, did you, could you just explain what those photos were of? Um, I don't, don't know if we can go back to them, but I think there was a well in one of them and then um, you were walking with a group and a woman and then the final one was um, countryside. So that's right. Um, um, we just came back last night. We went to a, a, a pretty uh, remote area, so around uh, 10 hours of drive from where we are um, and to, to visit uh, newly displaced, in, internally displaced people. So Ethiopians that have um, left home um, within the country. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's mainly women and, and, and children. Um, the men often stay behind because it, it to, in, to, to one degree or another, they, they may be involved in conflict or they are elsewhere in search for work. And the 11, 11, I've worked in the humanitarian um, field for, for, for 16 years or a bit more now. And the level of malnutrition and desperation, um, I've, I've, I've uh, not seen many times before. Mm -hmm. um, so you literally have we have visited families where the children were baking small pancakes the size of the palm of my hand um, with grains that they just found uh, around uh, them. And, and that was the only meal they had for the day. Um, so the situation is, 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 is really uh, alarming. And it's alarming also because it's a bit of a hidden crisis. Um, these are areas that are not necessarily on the radar um, because they don't make the headlines um, of the, the, the bigger media outlets. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point, Johannes, that, um, you know, we've got 20 million people at risk and um, it's really uh, difficult to get it uh, into the media, uh, the situation there. Thank you, and um, I'll, I'll move on to Simon Odong now. Uh, uh, Johannes was talking about the importance of water and Simon um, has coordinated the water sanitation and hygiene programs for Uganda, Ethiopia, Sudan, Kenya and Mozambique with both UNHCR and UNICEF. Um, Simon, can you tell us what UNHCR's uh, water sanitation and hygiene programs provide? and why they are so vital at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, water, sanitation and hygiene, we all know is a basic human right. And as UNSCR and partners, we manage very large systems, very complex water systems for millions of refugees is not only in Uganda, but worldwide, 4 point something million already. And out of that, 34%, uh, which is around 1.4 million is, is, is residing in Uganda, but across 24 countries globally. And uh, um, uh, around 150 something, 58 refugee sites, hosting sites, including Al-Qadida, where Johannes is speaking from. So in emergencies, 
we have to scale up because then when the arrivals come in, they put pressure on what we are already providing. So we need to scale up sometimes with expensive water tracking or uh, emergency pipeline extensions or very, very quick uh, actions to increase water access. So water is very important. Uh, if there is a water crisis, there's always a health crisis. Uh, mm. If there's a wash crisis, there's always a health crisis. And my special, it affects, it affects women, girls, it affects education, it affects um, a development because then agriculture cannot uh, be improved. It also affects mostly the food security because then uh, the crop production is, is, is greatly hindered. And yet with the drought, we cannot provide the water that we need, water for production, let alone water for domestic use. Mm -hmm. uh, if I give an example of Uganda, just to put it to scale, we have 1.4 million refugees and we provide 17 liters for every person. Uh, our target as UNHCR and partner is around 20 liters every day. But then with new arrivals coming in, these numbers keep changing and they keep reducing. We provide in excess of 23 to 24 million liters every day. And this is just to show you how much we have to, to, to work. Uh, we have large systems. In Uganda alone, we have 202 water schemes which are piped, 1,300 something uh, hand pumps and many other water sources. But these are all dependent on, on, on groundwater and yet groundwater keeps depleting with drought, with climate change. It, it's dependent on, on surface water, where there is flood, uh, structures for uh, abstracting water gets damaged. And yet these are very expensive structures. So if we don't invest more, uh, it becomes difficult for us to provide this quantity of water. And yet if you don't provide these waters, there's always potential conflict. The near arrivals come, put pressure on what is already existing, and then small fights start at a water point. It escalates into a tribal a clash, and before you know it, there is water conflict. Mm -hmm. And this UNHCR tries to manage by working with the government arrival and, uh, through a dialogue and then ensuring that we provide as much as, as possible and as quick as possible, the extra water that is required for these that are arriving. For sanitation, it's, it's even diff more difficult because then funding to sanitation subsector has been really dwindled. Uh, it's difficult to sell uh, sanitation and washing uh, latrines than to sell water supply. Every donor wants to see a pipe with water flowing and they don't want to see, they, they might not want to be interested in knowing how many people are washing their hands before they eat or how many have latrines. If I give you an example of the region now, latrine access is standing at less than 70% for every household. And we're, when we're talking of huge investments in latrines and with the flooding, we need a different technology with, with uh, low and, and high water table, we need a different technology that is quite expensive. I'll give you an example of Uganda. We have over 260,000 household latrines and we still need another 86,000 to meet the UNSCR standard of 85% uh, coverage at household level. So this is not easy to sell, but then break, if we don't invest in them, then we have a health crisis. We have already mm -hmm. had episodes of, of, of waterborne diseases and globally over 1 million people die every year because of water and sanitation and hygiene related illnesses. For children, every two minutes a child dies because mm -hmm. of lack of water supply. So this is, this is huge. That's what I could say, thank you. Thank you, Simon. I think um, it's actually incredible to think uh, just the size of UNHCR's work work in that in that um, in that area, um, and also I think it became clear in in the way that you talked about it why, why conflict 
with such scarcity of resources why conflict becomes such an issue and needs to be managed um, by UNHCR to make sure um, you know people are getting what they need you know if possible um, so we might just turn and, and have a look at the um, the role that conflict is playing in this crisis as well um, we are seeing ongoing conflicts in places like Somalia and Ethiopia. Um, they are also sort of causing food insecurity as people are forced to flee their homes and give up their livelihoods. But the region is also seeing new tension arise because of food insecurity and the drought as communities jostle for little, what little food, water and pasture um, or fertile land is available. Nazanin, I'll come to you. Um, you've examined this link before between conflict and climate stresses in the region. What, what have you found? Yeah, so the, the links are really complex um, and very much context specific. When I, what I mean by that is, what is the context? Is there uh, local governance? Is it inclusive? Um, can the government uh, respond to these kinds of climatic shocks, um, helping people whose livelihoods have been decimated? Or in fact, is there a sense that certain elites uh, in the community um, are the people who are going to be receiving most of the aid? Are those elites arming um, herders, for example, um, and creating the cattle raiding that has become um, a pretty criminalized operation in many parts of East Africa where the cattle um, is sold in, in markets uh, for lucrative profits and, 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 and moved across borders. So that's what I mean about um, the context. Uh, so, you know, we are seeing uh, le high levels of intercommunal violence um, in parts, uh, in regions where there is drought, of course, people will move to those areas where there's been precipitation, where there's been a bit of rain, uh, and that can spark violence. But one of the biggest factors I would say causing the current crisis um, is, uh, in Somalia anyway, is the fact that many parts of Somalia are so difficult and insecure to reach uh, because maybe uh, of, of the, the militant group Al-Shabaab. So you're talking about around 900,000 people living in those areas um, and many international aid agencies cannot reach them. So they have to move to urban areas such as Baidoa, Mogadishu, Kismayo. And that journey in itself is pretty difficult um, and is causing a lot of the health issues that we're seeing. And those urban centers are, are already overwhelmed with displaced people. Um, so you can imagine all, those, all the families arriving and putting pressure on, on water, sanitation, on food supplies, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're seeing, large movements of people moving because of this insecurity, because, um, of course, you know, you want your children to receive food and aid, but also you don't want your children to be recruited into these groups. Uh, so that's why we're seeing these these large movements, which are creating some of the, the, the food crises that we're seeing. And of course, a lot of these people are farmers, so they're leaving their farmland. And that's adding to the crisis, too, because they're not uh, farming and growing crops. Mm. It's clearly a very complex um, situation. And uh, in Somalia, both conflict and drought uh, has uh, been forcing people, as you said, to leave their homes and go across borders. And um, we have a short video um, now with the stories of some of these people. Oh, and ما 
بو مركب بنانكشن يا لو كودر جاي جليت الأبو رضاي يعني سنتة والكسب بنانك على كأبو رضاي أدوب بجي بي ملة أو إركيخاب ملة ما يبقى كأمي هذا الدقاق ما يبقى نين كسيد ترى نجوب جاسوي أبارتسي أركا سلاح كوك ما يبقى نين كسيد ترى الشباب ولا ذم هاي نضل كراو من هذا دب يوم ملة من هذا خوب ملة أبارو دوك كت كيكلة دب يوم وابل الشباب بقوري هاي So, um, Johannes, the camps in Melkadita um, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia are home mostly to people from Somalia. Can you tell us more about why people have been fleeing the country into Ethiopia? Sure. Um, so, so we are hosting, as I said uh, before, currently uh, a bit more than 200,000 uh, refugees from Somalia in five camps. Um, and the first uh, refugees arrived as early as 2009, so quite a while back. Um, and uh, there have been uh, further waves of arrivals. And the most recent one um, 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 at the beginning of this year and the first half of this year. Um, when, we, when we look at the when we ask people why they have fled, and if, when we look at the areas where they flee from, um, we see a, a strong correlation between areas that are held by Al Shabaab and their areas that are most affected by the drugs, uh, by the drought. Um, so, um, you know, people know um, that in order to be registered formally as a refugee in Ethiopia. Um, the reason to, to bring forward is insecurity, and that's what we hear most. But there's an underlying reason, and that is, is in a way um, uh, uh, a problem or a challenge that we are all facing with the international refugee re regime, that fleeing drought or climate change or, uh, is not a, a formal reason necessarily to acknowledge under the 51 convention to, to seek asylum and become a refugee. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because it is clear that we are only at the beginning of this. I think um, this drought is, is dramatic, but it's only, it's a wake up call. And, uh, and this phenomenon, especially in the Horn of Africa will be with us for the next years and decades. So people will flee um, areas that are affected by drought as they are fleeing today and will flee in bigger numbers. And they will flee towards areas where they can survive, where they can access water, where they can access food, where they can access basic services, where they can access energy. And I think the, because you were asking for the, for the, for the correlation between conflict and, and, and drought, um, I think, um, as Nazanin also said, what these area ha areas have in common is that they are all very marginalized areas. So if I describe our area, you know, we are a hundred, couple of hundred kilometers away from the national electricity grid. We are more than 500 kilometers away from the next um, Palmer Road. Um, there's no water supply systems apart from the water supply systems that have been put in place as part of the humanitarian response for refugees. So in a way, the refugee camps, it's a bit ironic, are better off than the surrounding communities in terms of access to water. Um, so what, the, what describes this area, and I think it's, 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 it's the same on the other side of the border in Somalia, is that there is, a, is, a, is an absence of any development investment over the last years. And it's, it's a vicious cycle because these investments have not come forward because of fragility and insecurity, but the absence of these investments kind of contributes to further fragility and insecurity. Mm. So what we have been trying in Melkadida is really to break this cycle and try to invest in, in, at a larger scale than usual into um, 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 irrigating land that is jointly cultivated by refugees and host communities. So we are irrigating currently more than a thousand hectares of land um, um, close to um, a, a river called Genale, which in a way is the lifeline of this area. And, and, and by doing that and by expanding this effort, 
um, we are trying to you know, support local food production and, and in a way uh, support the resilience of people. Mm. And Johannes, you, you touched on a really important point there around, um, I know that UNHCR's approach um, has, has been working with refugees and internally displaced people, but not forgetting about the host country and um, its population as well, because that, that doesn't work. Can you, um, is there more that you can tell us about that approach? So, I mean, for us, the approach here is really that the premise is that if we speak about protecting refugees and providing asylum space for refugees, um, the best protection is for us to invest in, in inclusive and equitable local development. So we cannot support refugees in camps and have the surrounding communities not have access to this support. And I think, um, you know, we have come a long way um, 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 as UNHCR also in, 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 in getting better at in having a more holistic approach. Um, uh, the, we have many situations in remote borderlands where refugee camps have become um, you know, islands of hope, where access to, to services is, is much better and, than in the surrounding communities. If I compare malnutrition levels, thanks to the support that we are receiving from donors around the world, the malnutrition levels, which are way too high still, are lower in the camps than in, than in the surrounding communities. So our approach really is to bring these communities together and harness their, their, their uh, ability or their, their ability and their aptitude to work and, 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 and that is in our case, really to the, this share farming model where we have cooperatives that are always 50-50 refugee and hosts where they sh cultivate a, 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 an area where we have invested into you know, water pumps, um, irrigation canals, support, we support with seeds and, 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 and agriculture uh, tools and they can, in the end, these two communities together can uh, produce food to feed the two, two communities. Mm. So the hosting refugees is not only a burden, but it's also an opportunity for the, for the, for the host community. It attracts also an, an investment from, from, from the international community and it becomes um, yeah, a mutually beneficial endeavor. Thank you, Johannes. That's um, it's, it's very interesting to understand that, and also to understand the challenges for UNHCR and making that happen. Um, you know, particularly from a financial or budgeting perspective as well. Um, Juliet, uh, South Sudan has been dealing with intercommunal conflict um, sparked over resources. Can you tell us what's happening there? What are you seeing there? Oh, Juliet, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, intercommunal uh, fighting uh, is about the, for example, Upper Nile uh, Unity State, there, there are people who have a cattle. In Eastern Equatoria, Western Equatoria, there are people who are farmers. So during the drought, what happened? The people of Upper Nile, they come with a thousand, thousand cows they go to Eastern Equatoria. And Eastern Equatoria, people have been farming and then those cattle, they go to eat the crops. And then there they start fighting intercommunal fighting. And that's, uh, um, as a result, we have a people who are displaced, who live their livelihood, and then they go into the displaced place, places, and then they are there waiting for food uh, supply. And of course, there is a cut of food from the BFP, as you know, 50% in the camp. Imagine then outside. So then food insecurity, sexual gender-based violence, and the people keep continue fighting, and it becomes very, very violent. So those are the intercommunal uh, fighting. And as a result, people lose all their livelihood. Mm. And also they, uh, during this uh, fighting, there's also cattle raiding and they take these cattle, they go to uh, neighboring countries. 
and then they start again fighting. And the most really painful there, they do um, revenge. So they go, when the things are calm, they come back again, they kill someone who is important in that community. So mm -hmm. then they start again. So this is the intercommunal fighting that we are talking, mainly caused by this uh, cattle raiding and this cattle immigration. And um, I, I was thinking uh, also on top of that in the camps, you have pe new people coming in and putting further strains on the resources in the camps for those people as well. Are you, are you seeing that as well? Yeah. Yes, in the camps also, for example, as we are speaking today, we have many people now who are coming from Kakuma, especially Burundian, who are entering now in South Sudan. And now, so we are obliged to put them in the camp where already the camp have food cut, resources are lacking, and we are obliged to put them in that camp. So there also there is a conflict between the refugees who are there and the refugees who are coming. So this is also something we are facing currently with the refugees coming from Kakuma, especially Burundian. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, we will just move on now to um, take a bit of a deeper dive into the ripple effect that the war in Ukraine is ha having on exacerbating the food crisis. Um, it, prior to the war, Russia and Ukraine supplied 40% of Africa, Africa's grain. Somalia alone used to import 92% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. And I know that we have a question around the impact of this um, on this situation. So um, we, will, we will sort of hopefully cover that. Um, so since the beginning of the war in February this year, there have been major disruptions to supply chains with Russia blocking Ukraine's Black Sea ports, as you'd know. Um, recently, we had the UN-Turkey brokered deal uh, between Russia and Ukraine, which has seen um, shipments of grain and other products um, resume. Uh, in fact, since the beginning of uh, August, one million metric tonnes of Ukrainian foodstuffs have been shift, shipped. Um, and we are seeing some of those global food prices um, being pushed down again or coming, you know, a little bit, but it is just the beginning and it's all about keeping those ports open. Um, and also the Western sanctions on Russia have driven up fuel and fertiliser costs, which also have that ongoing impact. impact. Um, Nazanin, What's been the flow on effect from the Ukraine war that you've seen um, in the places you've visited in East Africa? Mute again, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, very interesting what you just mentioned there and um, you know that the, the wheat that the WFP uh, had just bought from, from uh, Ukraine has made its way to Djibouti and will hopefully be going to, to Ethiopia. Um, but that's just really uh, a drop in, drop in the ocean. As you mentioned there, um, you know, huge amounts uh, of, of wheat, fertilizer, sunflower oil, et cetera, were uh, sourced from Ukraine and not just Ukraine, Russia too, um, Belarus as well. Um, so, so the impact has been uh, devastating, uh, not just because those supplies um, have been cut, but also because of this uncertainty around um, food supplies, uh, around the high global energy prices, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of countries um, have been stockpiling food. Uh, and that has contributed to the price hikes that we've seen um, in this region, in the markets, et cetera. Um, just give you an example here in Somalia, red sorghum is just a basic stable here, staple food here. And the prices of that in the market just down the road from here has gone up by about 120%. And I think it, people feel that these prices are being made up. Nobody knows from day to day how much food will cost. And of course, all of this pressure is being put on aid agencies like uh, yourselves, like WFP, um, and the, the costs of transporting food as well um, have, uh, have risen, of course, uh, with petrol prices going up, gas prices going up. <laughs> So it's just having a huge impact. Mm. Thanks, Nazanin. So, Johannes, we might, um, as as Nazanin has said, you know, this is having um, a huge 
impact on organisations like UNHCR. Can you can you tell us how how that how you're seeing that? Sure. Thank you. Um, just uh, just to take us one step back and to to echo what Juliet has said. I mean, I I, I would also you know, like to, to, to pass a word of appreciation to our colleagues from the World Food Program. They're really a tremendous partner and they're doing their very best. Um, and uh, nevertheless, they have cut across the Horn of Africa. They have had to cut food rations 50%. So just to, because these, these figures are so abstract, it means in reality, when, when I meet the families that I met the yesterday and, and the days before, it means that after 12, 15 days, they, they ran out of food. Mm -hmm. It means that you know, households are <laughs> having half rations, live on one meal a day, and, 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 and are scrambling to, to buy food in the local market. And, and, uh, and so in the, in the short term, it is extremely essential to to, to step up and, 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 and try to, to get beyond 50% uh, food rations with all the challenges uh, that we have. Um, Nazanin was mentioning the, the brave commander, the ship that arrived in Djibouti yesterday with 23,000 tons of Ukrainian wheat for, uh, for um, Ethiopia. That's hope, that's a glimmer of hope, but it's also a drop in the ocean. Um, um, so, so there's much more needed, and and I think we also need to to do much more to enable people to cope with the soaring prices. I was mm -hmm. mentioning prices before. If we take maize as one of the key staples in this area, it's increased from January to now by one hundred more than one hundred and forty. At 440 percent, the price. So a family that buys maize to, um, to um, um, as their main staple pays uh, pays more than four times more today than they paid six months ago. Mm. And you can imagine what that means in terms of, of the food that you get on the on, on the plate. So I was mentioning farming before. That's longer term. In the short term, I think it's it's really important to to um, uh, um, enable us and, and our partners to, to uh, provide food as, a, as an emergency measure because it is an, it is an emergency. Mm. And, you know, I think if we put that in um, Australian terms, having any food staple increase by 400%, you know, it would be so hard to believe. But when, you're, when you've got no money and you're, you know, um, yeah, it's just it's just unbelievable. Um, thanks, Johannes. So let's let's talk a little bit about solutions and um, the positive things that can be done to help them in these circumstances. So despite the challenges, UNHCR has been working with partners and governments in the region to support refugees and displaced people, and we've been hearing about that today. Um, both providing emergency relief and longer term solutions. As a part of the response, the UN Refugee Agency has been providing water for people and livestock, livestock um, emergency shelters and cash assistance. And we've heard about that today. UNHCR has also been working on measures to prevent and respond to protection issues, um, especially for child protection and gender-based violence. And uh, UNHCR is also providing nutrition, nutrition supplements for refugees and treatment for severely malnourished children in collaboration with UNICEF and the World Food Programme as we spoke. Joannes, um, can you provide us with more detail on how UNHCR is helping displaced people in the camps of Melkadida and um, working with partners to, to um, have an impact? Sure, thanks. Uh, maybe I start with the last that you mentioned, nutrition. Um, we, we are providing supplementary feeding for malnourished children and the, and the, and the, and the rate of or the, the, the percentage of mal, uh, malnourished children has gone up dramatically. So we have a, we have a very high oversubscription, almost double 
of the children that, that, that need urgent attention to address malnutrition. So what we usually do is we, we, um, we provide these, these plumpy nuts, these energy, uh, very nutritious energy bars as a supplement to, to families um, and, 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 and so that they, that they can address the malnutrition of the, of the child. Um, what is happening, what we see more and more, we, we saw normally you see a steep increase once you, 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 you provide such support to a child. The child comes after a week or two, and you see an immediate you see an immediate improvement. What we have witnessed over the last weeks and months, we don't see improvements. So we were inquiring why we don't see improvements anymore, and and what we realize more and more is that um, people just families just share the supplements that are meant for a child to address the malnutrition of the child. They share it among eight ten people because there's not enough food on the table. So they, they, they cut the small bars and small pieces and the whole family uh, um, benefits. And obviously the effect on the child is, is very reduced. So that's just one example of the assistance that we are trying to provide. But it's also an example that shows that we urgently need to be enabled to provide more assistance because we are not addre addressing the problem anymore. Mm. It, it must be so hard to watch, you know, that happening and um, know that in the past Plumpy Nut has been, you know, a, a really good solution, but the, the issue is so much bigger uh, because of all these different um, issues that we're, we're talking about today. Um, Simon, can, can you uh, talk to us a bit about um, the water scarcity um, and we know that it'll continue to be a problem in these areas. What are the longer term solutions for water supply to camps in remote areas? Okay, thank you very much. Um, when we speak about water scarcity, we are speaking about the availability of fresh water to meet demand. And if we're not able to provide a certain uh, amount of water, then the area is classified uh, as water scarce area of Africa, basically uh, Somalia, Djibouti, Kenya. This is hugely water scarce areas. Uganda is in water stress area, and it means that we're only meeting a bit of the demand. Um, in areas like in the Horn of Africa, there is drought and drought has affected the potential water sources. And the biggest potential water source is the groundwater. The water is not being recharged and the water is not everywhere because with drought, there is change in water quality. And then there is also depletion in water quantity. Now in such an area, there, there is need for development, uh, development approach. It's not humanitarian anymore because mm -hmm. the funding that is available to humanitarian is usually for emergency response and cannot be used for uh, massive investment in infrastructure. First in areas like in the Horn of Africa, finding water is a challenge. So that means we need to invest in, in robust uh, technology-based systems that will help us uh, accurately pinpoint. Because like, if you look at Somalia and all these areas, we are drilling a borehole of 200 to 500 meters deep. In Uganda, we drill to around 60 meters and we have water. Now, before we drill 200 to 500 meters deep of a well, which is very expensive, we need to be able to pinpoint accurately that when we drill here, we're not going to hit a dry well. So investing in robust systems for pinpointing is the first. in areas where there are no surface water. Where there are surface water, it is then important that we invest in systems that will extract this water and treat blood, the, 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 the infrastructure will get damaged. The in, slight increase in water level will damage the infrastructure because then it will affect its positioning, it will affect its proper functioning. So the first thing is to invest in that system and then the second thing is to invest in, in technologies that will make us drill 
and provide water over large surface areas, large distances. In Somalia and in Ethiopia, there's what we call the multi-village water schemes. You find water in one place and, and, and transport it long distances, over 200 kilometers and supply so many villages. But this has a caveat of cost. It's very expensive. We're talking about a pump that will pump say 100,000 liters. Mm every hour. This, these are huge pumps and they're very expensive to run. And in most of these areas, they are far from areas where there is electricity grid. You need to rely on diesel. We don't have technology in solar that will still pump say 100 or 200,000 liters of water per hour. So that means we need to rely on diesel. The cost is very high. To, to, to look at like say Somalia, there is the sea. Desalinating the seawater is a very expensive treatment process. But in an area where we don't have groundwater, we don't have surface water, we need to go to the sea. In Sudan, North Sudan, they are uh, desalinating the sea. Very expensive, and with no option, it's better than life being lost. Mm. Um, then we, we can also talk of, I talked about the bulk transfer, because not every area has water. So we need to carefully decide how do we transport water from one village to all the other villages in a very cost-effective manner. Now, installing these systems will require a management system that is trusted by the community because there is massive payments for watering animals, for, 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 for domestic use, and for agricultural purposes. So a system for managing that is a utility-based system, a commercially viable utility-based system is the one that can be effective in managing such systems. So Ethiopia is quite difficult where the government is the one managing the system and it becomes very difficult for them because they don't manage it with a commercial mind. In Uganda, it's, it's great because we have one of the best utility that a country can ever have. So it's quite easy to rely on them. Now, Ethiopia, Somalia, these systems are quite difficult to manage and they become very expensive. And once they're not managed well, there is war. Someone will come with so mm. many herds of cattle and he knows they're going to die. If they don't get water the next two, three days, conflict will start. And that is how there are garrisons. They are, pe people have coded off areas. This is a no-go for certain people because this is where we water our animals. And then the last way of addressing water system in such area is to invest in big water systems like surface water. Once it rains once or twice, uh, in some of these areas it might rain once in 13 months, or if you miss that collection, then you're not going to get water the next couple of months again. So we invest in large infrastructures, what we call affair dams or large dams that we call birkads. And they should be huge enough and calculated with drought, with the sunshine, there is evapotranspiration. So it means the water will keep producing. We lose more than half a meter to one meter of, of, of column of water in, 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 a, in an affair dam. So we do design so that we can take care of this uh, evapotranspiration. So investing in this large system will help us to have water in a place for a certain period of time. Okay. And then Rationing water is very important in such areas because if you don't ration water, then equity will not be addressed. The, the strongest will receive the water. So mm. a system of rationing water where the number of households will receive certain change on utilizing water. Make sure you're effective in using it. And lastly, reuse. Reusing water is important, but in a place where it is even difficult to get cost for infrastructure development. You cannot start investing in reusing water like wastewater from, uh, from, from, from toilets, from all this. You can't do that, but that's mm. also one of the options that we could, we could do. Thank you so much, Simon. I think um, when we're talking about drought and um, the issues that are going on, it's, uh, it's, it's really important that we get an understanding of the water supply issues and the challenges there and actually 
um, how it's different from being a humanitarian aid situation to a long term development situation, which um, requires investment and different ways of thinking about things as well. I'm mindful we've reached our time um, this afternoon and um, we'll put a QR code on the screen now. Um, but, you know, I hopefully I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who joined this afternoon. Thank you to Simon, Johannes, um, Juliet and Nazanin for um, just sharing all of that information this afternoon. It's a very complex situation, um, but uh, really important for us to get a, more of an understanding of it um, and the impact on 20 million people in the Horn of Africa. Um, we, if you'd like to make a donation, we have a QR code or you can go to um, our website, unrefugees.org.au and we, will, we have a, um, a campaign for the Horn of Africa. Um, so thanks to all of you for joining us today. A special thanks to our incredible panellists who are working in really challenging circumstances there in, in Africa, um, but making time to share um, these important stories. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, and we're hoping that um, we're going to be able to raise some much needed funds to help this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us, thank, uh, Trudy. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.